On behalf of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki Peace Committee, I uh, want to welcome everyone here. Uh, we'll be waiting. Uh, I think people are going to get a little signal saying it's being recorded. I think you may have to click on that. Uh, we're starting to get more people uh, on board. Uh, Max Abashevsky's on board, who's been you know, an ally of our committee from the beginning. Uh, Ilana Naylor, who has been uh, uh, an ally and participant in the committee, I would say, since probably the early 90s, Ilana, would you say that? And then we have Dot to Tin with uh, uh, the uh, Prevent Nuclear War Maryland and with uh, friends, friends in uh, Frederick. So we have Shinji Yamasaki on board. Yes, Johnny Lana's here. And yes, that's probably correct. And there's Mel, is it? No, it's not oh. Mel. No. Uh-huh. So as people are joining up, I'm going to ask people to mute. We can kind of introduce ourselves. We'll be, we'll be, uh, in about uh, eight minutes, we're going to have a minute silence. Uh, but leading into that, we're going to have a song from the Raging Grannies that they recorded specifically for us. So the Raging Grannies are going to do a Hiroshima song, and that's going to take us into our moment silence. And then after that, where we really have um, a treat, uh, Ellen Thomas and I have been working really, really hard the last month or more to compile a PowerPoint of photographs and documents over the last 40 years. And in a very real sense, it, it not only documents the history of the Hiroshima Nagasaki Peace Committee, but the peace and anti-nuclear movement of the national capital area over the last 40 years, including our participation in and, and enabling of a number of big, large national uh, uh, mobilizations that uh, you know we certainly helped helped to to organize. So it's going to be a real treat. Um, so uh, just for the, for those of uh, you who are not uh, who are new to the committee. Uh, our committee was organized in 1981, and the purpose of it was to gather together various uh, independent commemorations of the atomic bombing in, in the Washington, D.C. area, so that there was one umbrella group. And we initially started out as a, uh, a uh, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki ad hoc coalition. We uh, called ourselves, and our we were centered with the Washington Peace Center, uh, with the the Washington D.C. Gray Panthers, uh, several other organizations, and then gradually over the years we evolved into the Peace Committee and became an organization unto ourselves. So, so we are now at uh, the the uh, uh, f forty years since 1981. Um, so in what our, our dedication, we have a website, and in fact, I'll be putting that on the chat, ch chat as, we, uh, as we go along. Jonah, maybe you can put the um, Hiroshima Peace Committee's website, web address in the chat, if you get a chance to do that, put that in there. And then so people can go there. And one of the purposes of the meeting tonight is to, uh, create a historical document. So as we show the photographs, those of you who are watching who have memories uh, of the individuals in the photograph or remember the date, uh, you can identify it. And so Ellen and I have done you know, a pretty good job. We think we've nailed things fairly closely, but uh, Diane, for example, Diane Dorigo, you may have some thoughts about what year it was. Uh, Shinji as well. Uh, and, and and others, and so what we're going to do is we're going to create a uh, historical document. So we have a, we'll be showing the photographs and having a running collective commentary as we run them. 
Um, so I think I'm going to start by uh, saying that the purpose and the reason we are here tonight is to remember the anniversary of the atomic bombing. And one of the big initial influences on our group was uh, a, uh, a professor by the name of Robert J. Lifton. And he was famous for his studies of uh, Holocaust survivors. And then he did studies uh, on the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And one of the things he said resonated with our group, and that is uh, the quote, keeping alive Hiroshima's death may help keep us alive. And so we took that to heart. And uh, that also uh, links with the Hibakusha, the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that we've been hosting ever since 1983. And they also believe that they have a moral ethical obligation to keep alive the memory because they believe that when they are all gone, that the, the memory of Hiroshima and Nagasaki is going to disappear and that that is going to mean when that memory is gone, nuclear weapons will be used again. So that's why they are so strong at advocating for nuclear abolition and why we support them on that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen now and I'm going to find my raging grannies if I can find them here. I know they're here. Find a quick time safari. Here it is, right here. All right, and it should be sharing. And I'm going to make it bigger. And the raging grannies are going to give us a song. It's an honor for us, the Triangle Raging Grannies of North Carolina, to be with you today to join in your observance of the anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima, an atrocity that lives with us, and hope that the lessons from that day will be carried as we pledge to never again unleash such horror on our fellow humans. We sing this song for you and with you today. Twas long ago and far across the sea, so many died in an instant, Hiroshima. Children played out in the summer sun, then burned in a living hell, Hiroshima. The mushroom cloud and fireballs quickly spread. Now only their shadows remain, Hiroshima. Light your lights and never forget that day when we dropped those bombs from the sky. Hiroshima. How can those burn all across our land as we pledge that never again? Hiroshima. Yes, candles burn all across our land as we pledge that never again Hiroshima. So that brings us to 7.15 p.m. August 5th, our time 
and in 1945, at exactly at this instant, uh, the Enola Gay dropped uh, the world's first second atomic bomb on the city of Hiroshima, uh, killing over 100,000 people. So let's stop for uh, a minute of silence and uh, remember the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Like a lot of you, I'm sure, I am endlessly fascinated by the stories that emerge from nightmarish film productions. Francis Ford Coppola practically going insane on the set of Apocalypse Now. Martin Scorsese threatening to... Sorry, folks. Hang on. I'm going to get it. You're getting a preview of it while I'm backsliding it. Almost there. Okay, here we are. So Ellen and I have been working really hard on this slideshow. So. Uh, I, I chose this slide for the first one. Uh, I think it was probably taken by Mary Lee Stringer. A lot of the pictures you're going to see were, uh, were taken by her. Uh, this would have been, I'm going to guess, the mid-1980s. Uh, and uh, it's Joe Butler. Joe Butler's one of the founders of the group uh, and the children. And that's one of the things that we emphasized from the beginning is everything that we did involved the children. We, we Even when we would have our planning meetings, we would provide child care. In every public meeting, we would have Joe and myself and Nia Kaumba working with the children. And the children, at the end of the adults program, the children would present their own program to the adults because we believed that the children are our future. And it was Joe Butler, Nia Kaumba, um, my wife, our founder, Louise Franklin Ramirez, that emphasized that. So this uh, exemplifies uh, what uh, the, the committee was all about. And, and Joe was taken from us uh, too early in the, in the 1990s, but she was one of the founders. So... Um, this is a picture of Louise Franklin Ramirez with Women Strike for Peace. 
Uh, so I'd like to throw it open if anyone has any memories of Louise, uh, Ellen, or Jonah, or, you know, anyone, Shinji. Share memories of Louise because this would be a good time. Well, hey, John, how you doing? Doing good. Perry King. Yeah. I just remember um, how Louise loved music. And as a musician, in order to get my confidence up, I'd always look at Louise whenever she was in the audience because she was sure to be attentive and sure to be responding to the music. She, she always loved music. And she also took special interest in children. She always... When my children were growing up, she always was very attentive to them and would speak to them and, and pay attention to them. So I, I remember her very fondly just for those little personal human things about her that were very nice. So I'm showing some other pictures. Uh, this is a picture of Louise, Dan Ellsberg. Uh, that's Dave Dellinger locking arms with Dan Ellsberg. Um, this would have been probably 1976. Uh, and Dan, to this day, talks about how Louise, later on that day, got him arrested for the first time. So he credits uh, Louise for getting him arrested. So the next photograph is Louise. This might have been a year later in 77 or 78. And she's presenting dead roses to the Pentagon. Um, so Louise was very dramatic. So anyone who has a memory, Ilana, maybe you could weigh in because you know you know how dramatic Louise was and how that how much she meant to the movement. Well, John, I'm not sure I'd use the word dramatic. Um, I would use the word visionary in that. She was very creative in the way she was trying to get people's attention. So that, you know, Robert J. Lifton's book on psychic numbing, um, so many people, maybe all of among us, um, feel numbed by the, the task. Um, Louise never did, and she found visible artistic, creative ways of waking us all up. Yeah. No, I agree with that 100%. So this picture right here has a story. She, Louise told me the story. This was in 1980. I actually met her about five days after this, when, when I was released from uh, the D.C. jail. And uh, my affinity group went back to her house. My, my affinity group stayed with her. And so Louise was in front of the Pentagon and Dan Berrigan threw his blood on the wall. That's Dan Berrigan's blood. And the way Louise described it as a couple of young Vietnam veterans against the war came by with an American flag and they unfolded it in front of her and they said, we need you to purify the flag. So Louise put her hands in Dan Berrigan's blood and she is performing a purification ceremony declaring this flag needs purification. So this uh, photograph is actually pretty famous. It was taken by a photographer by the name of Alan Shub, who's no longer with us. But uh, I, I put that in there. I know some people might be offended by it, but I, I'm inspired by it. Louise really was a true patriot. So here is a haiku Louise wrote in 1980. So I'm going to hold that up there for a minute while people can read it. Maybe someone would like to, to read it out loud. Someone who's good with poetry. Please read it. Mel, are you with us? If Mel is with us, he could do it. Um, I, I can try to read it. Thank you. Haiku for Hiroshima Day, 1980. Bright shining lanterns, spirits of the past, by loving hands are lighted, 
by living hands are floated. After Armageddon, who will light the candles? Will there be clean waters to reflect the stars? By Louise. By Louise, yes, in 1980. So that would have been just before. So I threw this in here. I've been going through our records. We're, well, I'm going to donate uh, everything, all of the archives, to the Wilmington College Hiroshima and Nagasaki collection, including our library. We have several hundred books on uh, on the atomic bombings. Uh, and um, so this is a handwritten note. <laughs> the, I believe the very first one ever written on behalf of the committee. So it would have been in early April, early to mid-April. And then this actually was with it. So this is the rough draft. And it, this includes the, the, the wording that I worked on. So re everybody should remember that when we look at some of these documents, they're, they're kind of rough, but w we didn't have computers back then in the 80s, or they weren't widely available. We had to do price, press type, and we had to do hand-drawn graphics and all kinds of stuff. So this is, a, this is a rough draft of the very first letter that was sent out. And so this is a picture of the very first demonstration. So. Does anyone here remember May 3rd besides me? And I'm going to pause for a second, but jump in. Uh, so May 3rd was, it came out of the coalition to stop registration in the draft in Detroit. And there was uh, uh, an awareness that Reagan was quite an extremist and a militarist. And so there was a uh, probably the wildly, most wildly diverse demonstration ever organized that included a number of the socialist parties as well as fellowship of reconciliation and war resisters league and an early version of mobilization for survival and so we anticipated there might be 25,000 and 150,000 people showed up so this was the first demonstration the committee participated in and this was the flyer that we uh, handed out uh, so here's a picture of Louise and Arjun. So Arjun is uh, also our other founding member. I would include Arjun, Louise, Joe Butler, and I was the secretary. So I guess I would count too. So this is in the Grey Panther office. And Louise and Arjun are admiring the banner that we put together. And it was Louise that insisted we had to have that dramatic diagonal lightning bolt. And we, we maintained that graphic or a version of that graphic for the next 10 or 15 years because Louise, uh, uh, one of the things that she emphasized was Einstein's quote that when, when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he said, everything changed at that instant except the way we think and thus we drift toward unparalleled catastrophe. And that's the reason why we're remembering uh, the bombing tonight on the exact moment because of Einstein's statement. So that lightning bolt represents that abrupt rip in the fabric of the universe that marked the, uh, the beginning of the nuclear age. So and there's another version of it. I'm not, you can, but you can see all of the things that we did. Uh, all of the, a lot of this reflected Louise and Joe Butler's uh, mindset of involving the community, involving the children, making everything accessible. Uh, that was an emphasis. We knew, uh, we understood then, and I think we don't understand as well now, that if we want young people to be involved in the movement, we have to do child care. And, and part of our responsibility is educating the children as a community not just as members of families or members of, of uh, organizations or members of faith communities, but as a community to, uh, to work with the kids. So I'm gonna slow down a minute. I'm talking too much. So there's an, this is the program that we put together, uh, kind of rough, but you can see what we did. We, we really did a lot, uh, a lot of work. This picture was in the Washington Post uh, these are uh, our activists in the reflecting pool. 
um, floating the candles. So uh, I, I really want others to jump in though, because I'm talking too much. So, so does anybody else want to reflect on the candle floats, candle lantern making, the children's workshops? And feel uh, free, unmute. Max. Max. I, I wanted to reflect on media uh, based on something you said earlier. I got to Baltimore in May of 83. And when we were doing press releases, we would deliver them. We would drive to the Baltimore Sun. We would drive to all the TV stations. We didn't have, as you said, we didn't have computers and fax machines weren't even around at that time. But that's the way we try to get media attention. And sadly, at that time, 83 and in some years after that, we had three newspapers in Baltimore. And that is long gone uh, in uh, any city in the country, and except maybe for New York. But uh, based on all my experience of doing media outreach, today is probably the most difficult time to get attention to peace and justice uh, issues like what we're talking about tonight. I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Max. Uh, you know, and so those who don't know, uh, the Max shortly after he uh, moved to Baltimore, uh, he was one of the founders of the Baltimore Hiroshima uh, Coalition. And we've been partner organizations ever since. So, so I'm really glad you're on, Max. So I put this up. This was a report as the secretary. This was my report, a summary of what we did. And you can see, uh, you know, we did a lot. And so I think this is an important document because it names some names. It talks about the money that was involved. Uh, so let's move forward to 1992 and uh, the bus. So the Grey Panthers were one of our parent organizations. So we met usually at the Grey Panthers. The Hiroshima Committee was originally the result of a national Grey Panthers resolution asking Grey Panther networks to form Hiroshima committees. So in that sense, we were a product of Grey Panthers, also the Washington Peace Center. So we had many meetings there. And the Peace Center for many years was our fiscal sponsor as well. So this is the flyer getting ready for the bus. And uh, so the, the, our committee was responsible in many ways for um, organizing with the Peace Center, organizing 30 buses. So this is a picture of the Grey Panthers putting the uh, banners on the Great Panther bus. So, so a really brief story. So we entered Manhattan by the George Washington Bridge and we started downtown and the, in the bus. And the, um, this was a huge demonstration. Uh, a lot of people believe there were nearly 2 million people there. It filled up the Great Meadow at, uh, in, in Central Park. It had never been done before. So there was an enormous amount of traffic and they had police barricades set up and they were diverting the buses and Louise stood in the door and every time we got to a police barricade, she'd explain that we were the Grey Panthers and that we were Asian youth in action and that uh, we needed to get through because a number of the group were elderly and Louise talked her way all the way to Central Park. So our bus got through where no other bus got through. So here is the banner that was the, the, the uh, commemoration. Uh, the graphic was put together by Jim Richter. Uh, Jim was a tremendous artist, a young man. Uh, he did all the artwork for the Washington Peace Center uh, in the early 80s. And uh, in the mid 80s, he uh, uh, took a trip to Mexico, came down with a very bad disease, and he died at a, at a very, very young age. So this is the legacy of Jim. Does anybody remember Jim from the old days? Mm -hmm. And that someone said yes, they remember him? I don't remember him, but I did want to say about the uh, 
the second uh, special session on disarmament that the buses were traveling to is also uh, when the 10 foot campaign, um, which had learned that began at, that began at the first special session um, when my father met some of the exhibitors and they learned about the, the suppressed footage. And the second special session is when they brought their um, prophecy and lost generation and uh, showed those films at the second um, special session. And it was what, when my- What year was that? I think it was 1982. Was it that early? I thought it was 84 or 83 or 84. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm not great with dates. So. Yeah, I think that the, so we, we actually have a- No, it, and no, I take it back. It ha I'm pretty sure it has to have been earlier than 84. Okay. Anyways. Let me, let, we're gonna have a graphic of prophecy coming up. So I'm gonna want you to talk a little bit when we hit that. <coughs> All right, because we love our planet, that's another detailed uh, list of all the things we did and all the endorsers. One of the funny things about this one was we had we ended up with something like 100 or more than 100 endorsers. And then we got a phone call from, uh, the, from Sojourners who said, well, we have to remove our names from the list because the Revolutionary Communist Party endorsed it. And then we got a call from the Revolutionary Communist Party that said, well, you have to remove our name because some other group was on it. So I, I would safely say this was about the most diverse coalition in the history of the, the peace movement. But, it, but it's an example of the kind of work that we did. And it was all hard work. We had no internet. Uh, we had to, we did, we would go out and do pay, poster pay stops. Max can talk to you about that and, and others as well. Jonah, you remember some of that and Ellen as well. So this is 83 and this is Refuse the Cruise. Uh, this was the, our Canadian sisters and brothers started this and uh, it became international. This was because of Reagan's buildup and deployment of the Pershing missile and the cruise missile missiles to Europe. And so we organized it. So the next few slides are going to be pictures of the die-in. So you have uh, Louise is there. You can see her in her white red sunsuit and the others are all dying in. This was a different era. This is in front of the White House and we were able to do stuff. That's Bobby Rhodes, who was another one of our founding members, our Grey Panthers. Bobby was about six foot five and very slender, and he was the Grim Reaper. And I remember I made him a life-size seven-foot sickle that he carried. I, and so that's the Grim Reaper uh, watching the die-in. Uh, so that's uh, Paul the Peace Walker, Pat the Peace Walker, die-in for peace. Uh, I believe the Pershing equals launch on warning is Pat Burney. Does anyone have a feeling about that? Did they know Pat? Uh, it looks like her. Yeah, I think it's Pat. So. Yeah, here. yeah, John, that, that was Pat Burney. Bless her soul. Uh, uh, she's a great, great up, activist, she... both in, in Columbia and then she moved to Arizona. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. She's, they did. Again, not, she, no she's, longer moved, with us. she's moved back east again. I'm not sure how she, she's going. deceased. Oh, is she, she passed away? I want to say how much how wonderful Pat was and all of her um, work to divest uh, from GE, the GE uh, rate holders campaign. When I first got to Nears in 86, she was one of the main people that I worked with on that. And uh, it's it's sad that people pass on, but she was she's a wonderful activist for all those decades. So and this is the Peace Walker, and he was another very early member of our coalition. Uh, uh, he uh, walked across country for peace, carrying his forty pound peace sign, uh, mm. and and he really embraced the die-in. Uh, we all did. It was really it was dramatic. It was. Uh, it was a lot of fun. We used humor to make our point. Uh, and I think we need to keep that in mind that sometimes a little bit of humor goes a long way in terms of carrying the message. So, John, 
Yes. Can I say something? To, I don't know if people got the email, but maybe you can send out. I'll send you the email. Uh, there's going to be a memorial, in-person memorial for Pat the Peace Walker. He passed away in March of uh, 2020. And so uh, we're going to finally have an in-person memorial for him, which is coming up next month. So I'll send it to you. You can send it out to this committee, okay? I'll send it out to the committee, and we all we all remember the Peace Walker. Very, very yes, fondly. we do. He was, um, he was an important part of everything we did. So here's a, a, a declaration from Marion Barry. Again, back in the old days, we were actually able to get constructive uh, declarations. Uh, uh, we helped to write that. Uh, I think that it was out of the efforts of our committee and also the Proposition 1 committee and then the, the nuclear freeze campaign in D.C. that resulted in the nuclear weapons uh, freeze task force, which was an official U uh, uh, DC government uh, group, and they had their own office and they had their own budget. And we actually often had our committee meetings there at the Reeves building. Does anyone remember that? Mm -hmm. On 14th Street and U, when we would have our meetings there. So, so it was AC Bird was the coordinator most of the time. Another another person who's no longer with us, Dennis. Uh, Dennis and I worked uh, with AC over the years. He was a, a Navy veteran uh, who had been involved in some of the cleanup of the, of the nuclear testing. And he did a lot of work with um, the freeze campaign and also work with, uh, with veterans and, and uh, atomic uh, victims. And uh, he was an ally in, the, in our committee as well. And the Tacoma Park nuclear free zone. Right, right, that's true. So this, I want to say, well, I know that that's uh, Phil Berrigan, but I think that's MJ Park, a young MJ Park. Is MJ oh. on the line with us? Is that MJ, uh, Max? I don't think so. That was way back in the early 80s. I didn't so that was, she didn't get here until the 90s, right. So it's not MJ, but... Uh, the point would be that that's the that the Berrigans were there, the plowshares. Uh, Paul Magno was going to be on, but he uh, couldn't be with us because they're having a meeting. Uh, so this, I don't know that it was this demonstration, but it was at one of the demonstrations in the mid '80s, uh, where we were talking about peace, disarmament, and social justice and homelessness and. Uh, and we had a demonstration, and uh, one of many, where uh, Mitch Snyder and members of the CCNV climbed over the fence and had a die-in uh, on the in the front yard. And in our committee, actually played a role in that as well. Story about Louise, another story. Someday maybe we can all get together and uh, have a birthday party, maybe for Louise on September 28th, and maybe down at the uh, graveyard and. Uh, and uh, tell stories about the ways. It looks like those are um, tourists coming out the gate. They yeah, I think so. Yeah. So there's, that uh, looks like Thomas. I think that's Thomas, isn't it? Yes, that was 1984. And that's Bobby Rhodes behind him who introduced him. You can see how tall, if you remember how tall Thomas was and Bobby towers over him. And in the back is the Peace Walker. So this would have been 84. Yes, I agree with that. So and this is so in 84, uh, the Peace Walker came up with the idea of a peace walking delegation from Three Mile Island to Washington, D.C. So this was the rally and Louise and I and the committee put a huge amount of effort into it. And it ended up being Peace Walker and Bob DeRoe. So there's Bob and the Peace Walker, myself, Concepcion and Louise, uh, and they are getting on the bus to go to Harrisburg. Uh, and uh, so they uh, walked and then rode because they ended up getting blisters, but uh, they had their Peace Walk. So this is 84 and another example. So this was in 84 when we did Prophecy, Leslie. So maybe talk for three or four minutes about your dad and the 10-foot campaign and uh, Prophecy. 
Well, I, I will be happy to talk about it. I imagine most folks here have heard the story, but um, I will talk a little about it. Um, my father, as most of you know, was sent as part of the strategic bombing survey to film the after effects of the atomic bombing, mostly I think because the atomic bombing like other strategic bombing had been um, criticized. And this was, I think, intended to be a somewhat triumphal record of how effective the atomic bombing was. Um, however, my father and Harry Mamura, uh, who was a Japanese American uh, cinematographer uh, that were both part of this crew were shocked by what they saw of the human effects. And so they kind of peeled off and made a point of, of filming in the hospitals and trying to record um, the impact on, on people, on human lives. Um, I don't know whether it was their work or the whole project that uh, began to be a source of concern rather than pride to the powers that be in the US government. But the upshot was that all of the footage was classified top secret and suppressed for decades. And in addition, the black and white film, this was the only color film footage that was made, but Japanese uh, filmmakers had filmed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in black and white even earlier than the strategic bombing surveys film. Uh, but the American government systematically seized all of that footage and suppressed it as well for decades. The um, 10 foot campaign was an outgrowth of an encounter that my father had, as I said, at the first special session for disarmament at the UN. My father was already um, suffering from the cancer that he would eventually die of and that he believed was the late effect of his exposure um, in the atomic bomb cities. He was in the two of them for months. Uh, so he lived not far from the UN and he walked over uh, with his cane and went to look at the exhibit there that a, um, a Mr. Iwakura, an exhibitor from Japan had brought photographs um, to display at the special session on disarmament. And my father recognized um, a number of the people, but in particular, he recognized a picture of a young boy whose back was almost entirely burned off. Uh, many of you may have seen the picture. Uh, it was Sumitero Taniguchi. Uh, and my father told Mr. Iwakura, the exhibitor, that he remembered filming that young man, but that he was sure that the young man must have died soon after because he was so horrifically injured. And Mr. Iwakura told him that, um, that he had not died, that Mr. Taniguchi was still alive and was in fact uh, a peace activist in Japan. And he asked my father what he meant about having filmed him and he heard from my father the story of this film, and he began a grassroots movement in Japan to get the film uh, released and made available to people. Um, the, it was called the 10 Foot Campaign because once they succeeded in discovering uh, that the film had actually been put in the National Archives by operation of law some years earlier, but without any um, indexing so that no one knew it was there or could access it. Um, they wanted to get a copy and they uh, had a grassroots movement in Japan to raise the money to purchase a complete print uh, copy of the footage. Yeah, the, the, gov the government charged an uh, arm and a leg yes. for it. So the story that I was told was that, so the, the uh, footage was suppressed and it was labeled as top secret. Your dad tried for many years and went to many high-ranking government officials to try to get it released. So, and my understanding is, is that actually it was declassified, but the government 
classified the declassification. So no one knew that it had been declassified and that it was ultimately found unmarked somewhere in the basement in the archives. So I Yeah, that's I, that's pretty much right. It it had been held at actually an army yeah. at a Air Force base in California, um, presided over by Dan McGovern, who was the one who had uh, been ordered the the film crew. Uh, he's there's your, much your controversy dad, dad's about dad's his boss. role. <laughs> yeah, your dad's boss, right? So yes. Uh, so so let, we're going to go on, but I just wanted to say this was really important. This was, I believe, the second showing in the United States. So we and we did it here in D.C. We did a we did this yep. kind of things a lot. Uh, uh, this is just another uh, anniversary. This was the our committee. Uh, and talking about, you know, what we did on the, on the, uh, on uh, in the, the uh, 1985, the uh, 50th anniversary. John, uh, who was, yeah. was speaking before about their father? That was Leslie Suzanne. I'm sorry. My, uh, okay. I should have introduced myself. My name is Leslie. Susan. So Leslie, I, I think I've got your email from the last uh, thing we did, but I, I wanted to talk to you because I have um, uh, my landlady's husband was a photographer after bombings and uh, he also died of cancer. And I wonder if there's been anything done with the photographers. So we, we could potentially uh, connect on that if John. Sure, was, was I'll, put my, I'll put my I'll put my email okay. uh, in the chat again if okay. you like. I'll also put a link to the website for my book telling the story. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, no, well, you and I talked about the National Academy uh, thing. I think we we've been emailing. So I I want to let we're going to move forward on this, but let me just say something about Mr. Taniguchi. Mr. Taniguchi you know, lived a long life. He died a few years back, but he was one of the main uh, Hibakusha in Nagasaki, and he ran the, the gift shop. The, the Hibakusha have a little gift shop there even today, and Taniguchi-san ran it. And so with our friend Rieko Asato and others, I don't know, Shinji, maybe you reviewed the book, but uh, they published a book called The Bomb on My Back, and I believe Rieko uh, translated it into English. So I have that that book and I'll uh, send out a link to to people about where they can get that book. Shinji, do you, are you still with us? Oh, yes, that's a, you're right. Yeah, right. I knew. Mm. An excellent book. And I, you know, you can't really underestimate the role that Taniguchi played internationally and in terms of the Baksha the, themselves. He really was centrally important. So not only did he not die, he fought his entire life. So I'll, I'll always remember him. May, so may here's I, a, here's may I ask, yes. May I ask Leslie what her father's name is and is it possible to see, see the film Prophecy now? Um, so my father's name was Herbert Susan. He's passed away. Um, I, I just was trying to answer in the chat so as not to derail John anymore, but um, I don't know of any online access to prophecy. I have a VHS copy, but that's, you know, not as accessible these days. There is also a film that's a documentary that's just come out this year called um, Atomic Cover-Up that actually includes uh, more of the original footage than Prophecy did, um, and also includes some of the black and white footage uh, from the Japanese filmmakers, along with a narrative drawn from a lot of the first person accounts by the, the filmmakers. And that's currently circulating through a number of film festivals. And um, so, there, oh, yeah. there are. I, some... I, I, I hadn't heard about that, so I'm going to definitely get that. Oh, so, yeah. Lost Generation is available online. I believe it has Greek subtitles, but it has the it's the English language version. So if you look up Lost Generation, that's a 22 minute version, a shorter version of Prophecy. And then they also made a longer one called History, which I don't believe was ever uh translated into english at least as far as i've been able to determine 
No, I don't think Excuse so. Excuse me. Uh, I'm Ursula. I wanted to ask, could we make a list of resources after this is over for uh, all of us who are present and for others who are not present? So, Ursula, if you uh, go to the chat, I believe, Jonah, you put the committee's web address in the chat. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, it should be there. So, Ursula, go there, bookmark that, and I will get a list of resources on the site. I think it's an excellent idea. We should have done that long ago. Thank you. Sure. I'm um, there was going. also a, uh, a film last night on uh, the Howard University station, WHUT, called The Boy of Nagasaki, a very powerful. I'd never seen that before. Oh, I did have not seen it either. It, it's really amazing. Uh, John, if I could say something, Max again. Uh, I don't know if anybody know, knows this, but uh, all the UFO information at the Pentagon, or I don't know if it's all, but they have declassified the information about UFOs. And you can go to, to uh, Netflix and you can see this, it, you know, it's a series, isn't, it isn't a movie, it's a series. And the, the first one what does it start with? But it starts with the dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And then it segues and one of the scientists makes the point that in 1949, that the uh, Soviet Union got the bomb and was doing testing. And this particular scientist said, here was the opportunity for the United States and the Soviet Union to come together as brothers and sisters and, and have diplomatic relations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But unfortunately, it didn't happen that way. And then it, he started talking about 70,000 nuclear weapons. So this was a show on UFOs. So I found that fascinating that that's how they opened up the show. Thank you, thank you Max. So we're going on. So one P, this is a, a fundraiser. David Sawyer was uh, an important founding member. He was and is one of the one of the leading uh, cultural workers in the area, in the metro, metropolitan Washington, mid-Atlantic area. Uh, and we have, see the name of Winnie Gallant. We'll see her picture a little bit later. And she wrote a play called Performance at Stonehenge. And this was the world premiere featuring Stephen Lewis and Joe Libertelli, who still is with us at, uh, at UDC. And down at the bottom, you'll see Entertainment Sound Production, that was Patty Hack's group, and they were our, they donated the sound system for many, many, many years, and just another example of working as a community. So now here we are, 1985, and this is the 40th anniversary commemoration with the ribbon. So here is a, I believe, a one-fifth model of the Sadako statue. Uh, that was made specifically for this. You see Louise with her T-shirt and the Peace Walker. And we see Alita Degara holding the banner. I'm on one side and Alita's on the other side. Uh, looking with her long braid is Sister Nia Kaumba. And there's Nia Kaumba, a terrific uh, picture. I don't know who the gentleman is. I was thinking it might be Oscar Ordinus, but I think not. In the far background, you can see Bob Auerbach. Um, and so Nia Kaumba, uh, she was the one that always talked about the children and educating the children for peace. And Nia Kaumba in 1992 called the Grey Panther office and said, Louise, have you been to the toy store? It's nothing but G.I. Joe's. This was Ronald Reagan, Morning in America, G.I. Joe. And Nia Kaumba said the, the toy stores are nothing but war, toys, sto war toys, wall to wall. And so we organized one of the offshoots of the Hiroshima Committee was the Toys of Peace campaign against war toys. So Nia Kaumba left us last year, and she and Joe Butler and myself, I would say, were the ones that constantly and constantly and constantly uh, involved the children in all of the work that we did. So if anyone has memories of Nia Kaum, would like to say something. Mr. 
gonna move. I'm gonna move on. Uh, John, John, yes. John, this yes. is Shinji. Shinji. Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, but uh, I have to leave. Uh, leave now uh, because I'm. I'm get. I have to get ready for covering the world conference. Oh, give me. But, uh, yeah. 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 Let yeah. me, uh, Shinji. So do I to introduce yourself. Shinji was re reporter for Akahata <laughs> newspaper. I've known him, Miwa, his children, uh, Sutomo and Erica, and then the little one. I forgot the little one's name. Oh, yeah. And yes, and you have done so much work over the years as a journalist and as an activist in your own right that I'm so glad you were able to be on and we'll talk about you a little later. Okay, so, okay, thank you very much. You thank you. Say, would you say something, Shinji, before you go? Oh, uh, okay. Oh, I hope I hope uh, uh, we will we will overcome the pandemic and we'll we'll meet in Hiroshima uh, next summer. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That is a good thing to wish for. Thank you, Shinji, yeah. and say hello to Miwa yeah. and all our friends in Gensuikyo. Okay. Thank you. I will. Thank you. Bye. Okay. So. I'm going to, let's see, there it is. All right, that is Madame Hiroshima. So there's a story here. So Peter Minchall was the uh, prize winner in the T Trinidad Tobago Carnival. He was the People's Grand Prize winner. And he was a throwback because originally the dances, they were called mosques or mosses in Trinidad were political and they would be aimed at the power structure. And then they became, in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, they became very commercial and they lost their their political component. And he brought back the uh, political com component. And this was his masterpiece. It was called the Adoration of Hiroshima. And when he heard about the ribbon campaign, he wanted to come to DC. So he called, talk, called our committee. We made arrangements with Howard University and he brought two complete steel marching bands along with all of the dancers. So I believe they had over 70 individuals. They had an entire warehouse at Howard University. So our good friends in the ribbon campaign, this is my memory, kind of freaked out because they couldn't deal with uh, over the top drama. So we made the arrangements that the uh, Adoration of Hiroshima would lead the procession on Hiroshima Day from the White House down to the Lincoln Memorial. So these are actual photographs of that day. And I think, Ellen, you might have taken them. So can you talk a little bit? Um, no. <laughs> OK, you, yeah. you can't. But you remember this, right? Yes. And so this is one of the devils, <coughs> Madame Hiroshima. Those are peacock feathers, I believe. They, uh, the costume weighed 180 pounds, and it was 20 feet high. And uh, the person who was in there was a really, really strong dude because he had to walk two miles. So that's a picture of them coming down, probably coming down Constitution, I would imagine maybe the archives. There's a picture of them coming down the reflecting pool. So we, we had uh, 500 to 1,000 people. So you can see what happened is that as they moved down from the White House, people joined in. So this is just a small part of the group. And you can see the Hiroshima banner. You can see the Peace Walker sign. And you can see all the people. So we had, I don't know, probably 800 people this was certainly the largest demonstration we ever had. Of course, it was in the context of the ribbon as well. So this, we threw in some pictures of the ribbon. Uh, we were part of that. With the, one very short story about that is that Louise and I were part of the early organizing at Center for New Creation uh, uh, nearly a year before we started. And Louise was there. I was with her. Louise was the one that got the initial permit and when she went there, she asked, we were originally going to get a permit from the Lincoln Memorial to the Pentagon and around the Pentagon. She asked for a permit around the entire mall and the entire Capitol and the 
uh, Lincoln Memorial and the Memorial Bridge and around the Pentagon, she was told, well, we're not going to give you that. And she said, uh, but I'm going to put it in the application. Is that all right? They let her do that. And we ultimately, they approved her, uh, her idea. And we ended up with thousands of ribbons left over in spite of surrounding everything. So it was in many ways, perhaps the best organized mass protest against nuclear weapons ever held. Not the biggest, but but the best organized. So there's another picture, and there's a picture with Ellen down what there. Year, the what year do you think that was, John? It was 85. I don't, I don't need to think. <laughs> oh, I know for sure it was. Um, do you have time for a local story? Yes, uh, uh, Yolanda. So I was... Yes. Do you have time for a local story? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Say so no more than in two Manassas, three, Virginia, we be okay. Go we ahead. were the local organizers for the ribbon, and we hosted the state of Missouri um, as it happened. So they came, and we provided them housing and transportation in to go to the mall, and then had a showing of all of their ribbons at Northern Virginia Community College. Um, had a service of dedication for them before they went. And then I was nine months pregnant and unable to go to them um, around the Pentagon itself because I had just delivered by C-section, but notwithstanding, it was a great joy to host the state of Missouri and the men and women who came with their ribbons and be able to provide you know, a present, an exhibit for them and to provide them housing and food and a dedicated ceremony. And then multiply that story by hundreds of other churches throughout the DC area uh, and credit Center for New Creation and Marie Dennis. Then she was Marie Grasso and Joan Urbanzik and, and uh, uh, several of the other women at Center for New Creation for, for pulling this off. It was, uh, it was some of the hardest work I think ever done and uh, tremendously satisfying. So I this think was... it's really interesting because to hear it from this angle because I didn't live in DC yet and uh, we got a bus coming from Buffalo and we, we did this uh, protest and uh, it was real memorable for us, but you know, it was from the other angle. <laughs> so Max, can you identify people in this photograph? They're, they're Catholic workers and then B. Wardlaw on the side. Yeah, th that's that's B, obviously, to the left. That's Brian Barrett and the late Peter DeMott. If I could just say a little bit about Peter DeMott. He was a great activist. Uh, at this time, he was living at the Jonah House, and that's where he met his wife, Ellen Grady. And uh, eventually, they, they went up, up uh, to New York. Uh, to set up a Catholic worker in Ithaca. And he was, one way of raising money for the Catholic worker was to do painting. And he was up very high uh, painting. He fell, he was critically injured. This was a very rural area. The first hospital that he was taken to, uh, they, they, they said, really, you got to get to a better, better equipped hospital. By the time he got there, he, he was deceased. Uh, last time I saw Ellen Grady was down at the October 2018 for the uh, Kings Bay Plowshares trial. Uh, uh, they, they do a, a run. I, don't, I, I guess they didn't do I think they did it virtually the last year or two. But they, they do a run in his favor up in that area to raise money for uh, peace and justice uh, gatherings. Uh, Brian Barrett. We, we protested Hopkins every Tuesday, uh, the nuclear weapons research. Brian frequently comes out and joins us. And if folks don't know this, <laughs> but Johns Hopkins University just got a $530 million contract with the Air Force to work on nuclear weapons. And then they got a, another little contract for $23 million, And they're both to work on ICBMs, if you can believe this. And you know, as John said, we started our, our campaign against Johns Hopkins in 83. They were probably getting about a, 100 million at that time. 
Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory today probably gets about a billion dollars. So uh, we haven't been very successful. Yes, but you have been dedicated, Max, and you guys are there all the time. So I, my hats is off to you. So let's get back to the pictures. So this is Sita Aka. Hopefully. And, and Alan, maybe you can say a word about Sita. Yes, I would love to say a word about Sita. Sita Aka Polakule was from Sri Lanka. And her life was about um, uh, people getting along with each other and uh, learning to be happy instead of miserable. And this was in 1985 on Hiroshima Day, August 6th. And she sang and danced and charmed everybody. And she was very helpful to us. She had an apartment. And before we had a place of our own, she always welcomed the vigilers to come in and get clean and fed. And um, we miss her. Yeah, we do miss her. This was taken up at Lafayette Park. This was before we did the procession led by Madame Hiroshima. So there were, you can see there were a lot of people even then. And, and they, by the time we got down there, it was bigger. So I'm just going to keep moving. It's Ellen talking. Uh, uh, so this is a very brief story. This is the Peace Walker again with Louise. This was part of the documents that got water damage when we moved from Arlington, unfortunately. But some of the damaged ones I saved, even because it's the only record we have. Uh, we discovered the Enola Gay, the rusting fuselage out in a, Mar in a warehouse in Maryland. Uh, we asked the A-bomb survivors if they wanted to go out there and see it. And there was some discussion and they decided they wanted to see it. So it was the first time one of the, one of the women that, was, that saw it was also one of the ones that actually saw the plane before the bomb was detonated. So this was the first time that the Abaka Shah saw the Enola Gay since 19... Uh, 45. So it was a tremendously emotional um, event. John, I have a question about that picture. Is yes. the red? Is that just a flaw in the photograph, or was no? That that's water damage. That was that was photographs that were stuck together because of a a leaking roof when we moved. I was hoping it was paint. <laughs> no, no. This was it was in a warehouse. We found out about it uh, somehow and. Uh, so that was before the exhibit. So this is just a really quick one. Louise and Thelma Rutherford being uh, awarding uh, T-shirts to Bishop Tutu and his family. So I just threw that in there because Louise was uh, very active in not only in the anti-nuclear movement, but the environmental movement, the human rights movement, education reform, social justice. Uh, she saw everything as connected. She was intersectional before it was the term was defined. Uh, picture, this is uh, Chernobyl. After Chernobyl, we had a protest about Chernobyl. So that's Carlos, that's Louise. That's Carlos Van Leer. I, that might be Sita Aka behind her, I'm not sure. And that's holding the sign is Patricia Axelrod. So Carlos uh, was a very strong Veterans for Peace and he played the accordion and uh you know he was another uh, really strong character and patricia was a researcher uh we i think we'll see more of her later so here is the 88 commemoration activity i threw all these in here all of this is going to be put on the website so people can see it uh this would have been probably 86. You can see Louise, there's water damage in this too, but I kept it because it shows Joe Butler and Rick Tingling Clemens. Uh, Rick and Michelle, did you come on? I don't know. Uh, Jonah, did they come on the program? Uh, they were very active. Rick represented us for about five years in Japan, often paying his own way. So They, they did not come on. Okay, they came on for our 40th anniversary and we really appreciate all the work that they've done. There's a picture of Rick and Michelle when they were young. 
So again, probably 85, 86. Uh, there's June San and one of her peace marches. I'm not sure where this was, but uh, I threw that in there because uh, the, these peace marches were led from the Peace Pagoda and uh, they were led by Nippon San Mihoji. Uh, they also did a number of marches with the American Indian Movement. So uh, June San, uh, I believe is still alive. I last saw her several years ago. I think uh, this might have been the Great Peace March. It may have been, yes. Uh, she's doing stuff in New York, um, has been very supportive on the West Valley fight, uh, fights at West Valley, the nuclear reprocessing site. So she's uh, she's got her place in near Albany. Yes, no, I, I know. And she, I mean, she's she's still active. So if you were on her walk, I speaking from experience, she'd be up at five o'clock and everybody would be up at 515 and we'd be on the road by 630 every day. And June San was the first up and the last to go to bed. And so, and here's another trooper, another Iron Woman, June San to Concepcion. So, say a couple words about Concepcion, Ellen. Well, she uh, she she joined Thomas in the vigil in 1981. He started it in, in on June 3rd, and she came in the fall of that year. And she was, they were on separate ends of the White House sidewalk and then they both got arrested and teamed up uh, to make sure that somebody was awake while some, the other person slept so they didn't get arrested again. And um, she was completely devoted to Thomas and she was completely devoted to the vigil and she was out there until she couldn't be anymore a few months before she died in uh, 2016, so. So, and this is a historical photograph because uh, in case someone wants, wants to know what that white stuff is, this was actually taken at a time when there was still a season called winter. That, the little black humor there, folks. Half-Life, uh, this, uh, well, we showed this, I believe it was the US, uh, Premier, we uh, brought in Glenn Alcalay, uh, uh, Dennis, you know, remember Glenn? Uh, Glenn worked with the Marshall Islanders uh, for years in the Peace Corps and then later still working up in uh, New York. And this was the true story about how the um, uh, Bravo explosion was exploded with the scientists knowing consciously knowing that the island of Utrecht and Rongelap would and the shipping lanes would be contaminated. So he went back, looked at the historical weather reports and the story had always been that the winds unexpectedly changed, but uh, Dennis O'Rourke proved that that was not, uh, not correct and it was all a big lie. So that was done, I believe this was the US premiere of that, so. Uh, just another example of the kind of work that we did. 1987, this is the you know, kind of layout that we did. We did a little booklet that time for, you know, and sold uh, ads, I think. You know, it was basically anything to try to raise money. Uh, you know, it was you know, always difficult. Money was always difficult. In everything that we did, our group was always all volunteer and we were always self-funded. Uh, Floating Eagle Feather. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers him, but uh, he was, he came, he did a benefit for us, just a tremendous individual. Uh, he died much, much, much too young. He was one of the victims of the AIDS epidemic. Uh, someday, if you want more stories about Floating Eagle Feather. Uh, this is another, this is 87. This is when we brought in a Korean Hibakusha for the first time. Uh, you'll notice that the keynote speaker that year was Joseph Lowry, who was the president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and he paid, paid his own way. Uh, he not only came, but he paid his own uh, uh, airfare and hotel bill in order to participate. So it's just another example. One year we had Dick Gregory, we had Mishu Kaku. Um, You'll notice we showed an outdoor showing of Lost Generation. We actually had a projector down at the Lincoln Memorial and we showed uh, 
bus generation on a screen after dark. So that's just an example. Peace Center, every year the Peace Center, what this was, I'm not sure what year this was, 87 probably. Mark Rabinowitz, uh, another friend of ours, uh, he was uh, uh, a research assistant for Kitty Tucker. Uh, Dee, did you know Mark, Diane? Yes, and I still know Mark. You know, Mark talk, is, talk a little bit about Mark. So Mark is uh, uh, brilliant. He worked with Kitty. I met him when I first came to D.C., uh, the health and I think it was Health and Learning Institute, but it, it, health, I, health, health, maybe and health and energy, health and energy. Okay, um, so uh, he worked there and uh, until it closed, I believe, and then uh, he has since moved to uh, the Pacific Northwest and continues to be active on, on climate issues and on um, you know survival of the planet. Uh, he, um, I don't know if I can tell this story um, quickly enough. Um, he and Mary Olson, who was also, uh, who worked with me at Nuclear Information Resource Service, the two of them at one of our, um, we used to have uh, action camps. And he and Mary and, and two others came together just by chance, all under a full moon, and they decided that the thing to do was to uh, uh, to store the waste at the reactors using nuclear power reactors. This is and uh, and to do it using solar electricity at at the reactors. And in fact, that is what some reactors do to have uh, power. And it's what happened at this uh, Sacramento nuclear reactor that closed. They ended up uh, putting solar panels, solar collectors up, solar panels. Um, so anyway, uh, he is still definitely uh, part of the fight. And yes, and Mark has a website called Oil Empire. If people want to go and check him out, he does a lot on uh, on peak oil and energy issues. And you're, I agree with uh, Dee that uh, Mark is truly a brilliant person. So Ellen, you want to talk about this photograph? This is, uh, on the right is A.C. Gearhart, and uh, on the left is a fellow who called himself Stoner and who was part of the vigil for a while, and A.C. was Thomas, probably Thomas's best friend, and is currently living in West Virginia in not terribly good health, but still his um, wonderful self. Yeah, I need to get his address from you. I probably need to go visit him. Okay, another Peace Center newsletter, 88. Uh, the Peace Center really was a partner organization. Um, it became a real true uh, community networking group. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it's not with us anymore. We really miss it. Uh, there's a fundraiser. This was Longfellow Street. This was Stuart Morris's house. And it's an example of the the community involvement i mean it was the whole community involvement we uh there's a slideshow from louise and my trip to uh the soviet union we went there with the gray panthers in 1988 so apparently we did a slideshow there and it's just an example of how uh it takes an entire community so you know, it was Louise and myself and a handful of others that did a lot of the work, but it was everybody. You know, Louise and I couldn't have done any of this without the entire community. Uh, so that's just an example. Uh, John, the, the, um, yes. Stuart still lives at that house in Hyattsville. Are you in touch with him? Yeah. Can you give me his information? So I need sure. To call. Yeah, so, I'll, oh, I'll get All right. Then. All right. So we... We need to go back. So Stuart, back when I met Louise, it was the Coalition for Non-Nuclear World and my, my affinity group got arrested. And I ended up spending 12 hours in a Pentagon basement locked to Stuart. He and I were hand handcuffed <laughs> together, uh, waiting to be sent to the, originally to the Arlington jail. And then uh, we ended up, I ended up being sent to DC jail for, for five days. But Stuart, Stuart and I have an unbreakable bond. 
<laughs> basically 12 hours without going to the bathroom chained together. So, so this is a, a, a banner we did. This is a drawing that was done by Louise's daughter, Gilma. Uh, Louise sent her to Hiroshima twice. So it's a, a, a women dancing around the world, protecting the earth. And that's Louise right in the middle. So you can see the, the resemblance. That was Gilma's. That's, that's my dove, by the way. So <laughs> there's Louise with Patricia. And we have B in the background. Now, who is that in the orange shirt? Does anyone recognize him? Because I do. I think, think right behind Louise is maybe Joe Byrne, maybe. Or maybe Jerry Park. Yeah. But I'm not sure who's in the orange shirt. Are you, do you know who that is? All right. Pete, Pete something, I think. Okay. And there's... Is that Austin. Pete Farina? Maybe. Yeah. Well, this is Cynthia Johnson on the right. Yeah. Patricia, I'm not sure who the woman in the striped skirt is, but that's Kumar Ramanathan, uh, who was a student at AU, and he be, he was an important organizer for two or three years. Does anyone recognize the woman with the sunglasses? All right. So talk about Winnie. Ellen, you talk about Winnie. Okay, there's Winnie and there's Song, um, Brett Hamrick, who um, is now living in Texas. He did live in the Philippines for a while and got married and, and um, he was part of the vigil um, and part of the ragtag band that was performing out in the park and helped to do the uh, weekly um, food not bombs for homeless people to come and get fed in the park. And an artist, um, I, there may be a, a drawing of, of the vigil later on, uh, that was done by song. And, then and he is currently writing a book about the Tao, which is um, excellent. Yeah. And Winnie was one of our really strong community members, member of Great Panthers, member of Women's Strike for Peace. Winnie was very creative. She was always writing poems and songs, and she wrote performance at Stonehenge, which I really, I don't know if I still have it or not. I, you know, I, I maybe I'll see if I can find it on the internet somewhere, but it was very, uh, very creative anti-nuclear work. So just another example of the network, how strong the community network was. It really was. Winnie lived in a, in a one room apartment and she made her apartment available to the vigilers anytime. Indeed she did. And for meetings too. So another Peace Center a newsletter. Uh, this is, a, I threw this in there. This is a typical example of probably late 80s, early 90s of our commemoration. We would uh, form a big circle. We'd have our moment silence. We had, we'd have a microphone. You can see the Peace Walker there. And, uh, you know, typically we would have maybe 70, 50, 75, up to 100 people. Uh, you know, occasionally it would be much larger, but usually that would be how big it was. Here's another one of Concepcion at the Vigil. Uh, this is a, 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 another banner I, we recycled a lot. So, um, so this one, just, is it just to see it. So this is Winnie and the ambassador to Iraq and Louise and Josephine Butler. And uh, Louise and I went out and picked the wildflowers. So those are wildflowers, a bouquet that were given to the ambassador of Iraq on the eve of the first Gulf War in the early 90s. So we were trying to prevent the war. So this was an early effort. Uh, and here's a maybe, what would you say, late 80s of you and Thomas, Ellen? Yeah, wave that was the first peace wave, so maybe uh, in, around 1990, I think. Maybe in 90, yeah, late 80s, late 80s, 90. Yeah, and, it's and, just, and the dog midnight. And you know how much different the, the White House was back then, it was a different era. They the paranoia was nowhere near what it is today. 
There's the Little Friends for Peace, MJ's group. So that I think that's Timmy Park, and that's Sarah Magno, and that's one of the other Park boys there. And so the so the children played a role every year. So typically the Little Friends would come and they would lead a children's program, and the children would make the candle floats while the adults would talk. So this is a great picture, same day, and uh, that's Sarah banging her drum. And you got the TV camera there, and that's Star Bowie, who is another one of our really uh, important community activists over the years, and she's helping uh, Sarah. So it's just another really example of uh, how 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 really strong the community was back back then. And there's uh, the Peace Walker, "Don't Bag Our Boys." This was done on the night of, I want to say, the, Ellen, the night of the uh, January 15th, shock, shock and awe. Yeah, That January was the night 15th. of shock and awe, right? Yeah. A lot of people there. A lot of people there. What year again? 91. 91, the first, first Iraq invasion. That was the beginning of 40 days and nights of drumming. So, so Proposition 1, talk a little bit for a minute or two about Proposition 1. Okay, in 19, December 1990, we actually incorporated in order to um, start a uh, voter initiative campaign um, to uh, get on the ballot the idea of the United States and the Soviet then Soviet Union agreeing to abolish their nuclear weapons and use the money instead for human needs. And we had been circulating a petition in the park since 1986 and um, uh, going up every year and delivering um, copies of the petition to um, Congress members asking them to introduce legislation and um, they didn't. And so a fellow named Joe Vigorito came and joined the vigil. And he's, he had been at the impeach Meekum campaign um, that got rid of Governor Meekum. And he said, what you're doing isn't really getting anywhere. You need to have petitions that will actually get the idea on the ballot. So we did. And in 1993, September 1993, at a special election, we won the election. And as a result, Eleanor Holmes Norton has introduced um, the nuclear weapons. It was the Nuclear Disarmament and Economic Conversion Act, but now it's called the Nuclear Weapons Abolition and Economic and Energy Conversion Act. And it is now calling for um, the U.S. to sign and ratify the, the uh, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and to use the money to transform the war economy to a carbon-free, nuclear-free, clean energy economy and to provide for other human needs. It's H.R. 2850, and you can find out more and you can uh, send letters to your representative and you can do all sorts of stuff if you go to prop1.org, that's P-R-O-P number one.org, and I'll put it in the, in the chat. So uh, this was 91. You'll notice that we were part of a, a youth caucus that was a worldwide link up, and we were part of the live link, uh, I believe at the White House, and we showed Microphone, which was one of the really good early Chernobyl movies and Kitty Tucker was the uh, discussant. So maybe Diane, can you just talk briefly about Kitty and Bob? Yeah, it takes me a second to unmute here. Um, Kitty and Bob were uh, basically mainstays of nuclear information in, uh, in the DC and the, in the Capitol uh, when um, Chernobyl happened. Uh, they just stepped right up, got press attention, uh, notified the media, the public about the basics of radiation and the dangers of radiation uh, in a way that would never otherwise have, have happened. Um, they're just brilliant, again, um, uh, resources uh, on, on radiation, but also on political strategy. and. Uh, Kitty is uh, the person really to credit on 
the reason that we even know about Karen Silkwood, because she uh, decided to make that an issue, to make that a, a to, to make that a common common uh, knowledge, and uh, she did it. And uh, Bob, of course, worked at the Department of Energy for a while and uh, did negotiations with Korea over uh, nuclear reactors there. So they are uh, Tacoma Park legends. Well, and more than that, because you know Kitty and her work with uh, supporters of Silkwood in the late seventies. In a real sense, I, I called her the grandmother of the uh, anti-nuclear alliance movement because it was her work politicizing, publicizing Karen Silkwood that really pulled together a lot of the alliance movements. In my case, it was the Arbor Alliance. Uh, you know, I know with Paul Gunter, it was uh, the the uh, the uh, clamshell. The clamshell, right? <laughs> You know, but they and, were, but, but but we were all over the place, and all of us knew about Kitty. We didn't know her, but we knew about her work, and so I call her the mother of the whole anti-nuclear movement. Well, I didn't sense. know that part of her, but I did know um, that she brought radiation experts like Dr. John Goffman, Dr. Carl Morgan, Dr. Alice Stewart. Dr. Rosalie Bertel, Dr. Carl Johnson, yes. uh, together in in the same room, in the same meetings. Uh, these are the people who were honest, stayed honest, and uh, did the studies and, and provided the basic information that the government is still trying to, to overcome. I mean, there's a major industry effort to say that low doses of radiation are not so bad or that there's a threshold, and it's because of their work and then kitty uh coordinating and publicizing their work that it is uh commonly known that and kitty, kitty 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 did one other thing that's not well understood so kitty was the one of the major if not the major initiating forces in the 1980 coalition for a non-nuclear world which was the largest protest uh, at the Pentagon, still to this day, the largest arrest. That was where Louise and I met. And Kitty was largely responsible, I would say, for the initial organizing. And it was her work. She helped to bring nuclear weapons, anti-nuclear weapons, and anti-nuclear power together because there was a lot of resistance there. There were a lot of disarmament activists that saw peaceful nuclear power as a positive thing. And there were a lot of anti-nuclear power activists that didn't want to dilute the message. And so Kitty did. And Kitty also brought in um, Native American treaty rights and other issues. So so um, I wanted to bring that in. But I also want to change gears because we still have a lot to go. So Dennis, you're still with us, right, Dennis? Yes, I am. So Dennis, uh, so you look at this banner and you'll see the theme of that year was radiation victims speak out. And we had a, a number of radiation victims. And I think we've got another uh, actual document a little bit later. But uh, from the very beginning, we were uh, involved in supporting nuclear victims and nuclear survivors from all over the world. And in fact, at least partly that may be the way that you and I met. It might have been through some of the the uh, nuclear victims organizing, survivors organizing that you and I met and that you got involved with the committee. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, actually, I came to it uh, a little later than that. Uh, it was after I retired, I started to attend the uh, hearings that Hazel O'Leary uh, was organizing under the Clinton administration. Uh, about radiation victims, people who had uh, been experimented on during the, uh, the Cold War, uh, people who had been fed uh, radioactive oatmeal and, uh, and uh, people who had uh, in Rochester who had been actually uh, injected and, uh, and fed plutonium back when plutonium was a new, wasn't even, didn't even have a name. It was, uh, it was top secret. So uh, that's when I came to this. I came to this relatively late. You guys had already been working on this for two or three decades. And I came in the mid 90s 
with Hazel O'Leary. And that's where I got to meet you and uh, the radiation survive atomic veterans and all of those people and Cooper Brown, who was trying to organize uh, all of the radiation victims in one group so that he could manage them. Uh, I don't know exactly when we first met, but it was around that time. Yes, indeed. And you've been with us ever since. And we've had some great adventures, Dennis. Right. So I want to I move on. So, Perry, are you still with us? Perry King. Yes. Perry, unmute yourself. I want you to talk a minute. I'm here. Yeah, John. Hey, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. It's a picture of you up there performing with the banner in the background. Maybe Nick, that might be Nikki carrying the banner. I'm not sure. But can you talk that was a little in bit? Rock star days, Betty. That was my I was a rock star then. Talk a little talk a little bit about your memory of the movement back then and how we were active in so many different areas that it wasn't just anti nuclear, but it was everything from yeah. food not bombs well, to, uh, absolutely. to, uh, to yeah. occu occupying the the homeless shelter <laughs> talk a little bit right. about I was, yeah well i at that time the central america solidarity movement was really strong and so i was involved with the nicaragua information committee and the uh, guatemala vencerar committee and our philosophy we were kind of uh, opposed to some of the uh, net networks and solidarity. Our philosophy we had to link issues in the U.S. with issues in Central America. We couldn't just talk about helicopters in El Salvador without talking about the war on the poor and so on. And, of course, anti-nuclear uh, movement was all part of the anti-militarism, anti-imperialism movement. And, of course, at that time, we also had a strong movement to support political prisoners like uh, former Black Panthers, Black Liberation Army activists, Puerto Rican um, anti-imperialist, American Indian movement. So we had a whole coalition of all kind of people around that, um, especially around those themes. There, of, there, uh, there, there, there was an under there was an understanding back there that the movement was a capital M writ large, and it was all connected. I think that was. Yeah, I think you made that point really well, Perry. Yeah, uh, you know, so uh, I, I want to continue because at nine o'clock, it's going to be the World Conference and we have a link in the chat box, which we're going to remind you of again. But we want to sign off at nine so people can at least for a little while click on to the World Conference and say that you participated. And this is really important because we've participated as a committee uh, almost every year for the last 30 years. So. So I'm going to encourage everyone to just, if even if only for 15 minutes, click on the link. It's at the beginning of the chat. Uh, but let's continue. This is Everett Foy. Everett was a great artist, a poet. Uh, I think he's here serving as an MC. That's Thomas. Thomas was not short. Uh, Everett was very tall, very, very creative. And he was a central part of our committee for, for many, many years. Uh, I've lost track of him, so if anyone is in touch with Everett, please let me know. Uh, here we are. This is a great photograph. That's a picture of Mary Lee. A lot of the photographs that we've seen tonight are were taken by Mary. So there's a picture of maybe I took that one of her, but I think this is a good one because uh, every year, you know, we'd remember uh, uh, Hiroshima at 7:15. And then we do the candle floats right at dusk. So this is a beautiful, beautiful picture of probably early 1990s. So there's a picture of the candles floating uh, either on the reflecting pool or, or at the gardens behind the Vietnam veterans. Uh, there's, another, there's a picture, 93. And uh, so this was the bomb in indigenous people. So Lamomi Brown. Cooper Brown's wife, who's still with us, Jay Mason from Canada, uh, and Tom Smith uh, spoke. So, and uh, so it was, um, you know, I mean, this is an example of the kind of work that we did. Uh, I don't know that there's any other group in the entire U.S. 
that had that kind of a broad focus and brought in all of these various aspects to say it wasn't just you know the the Hibakusha in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and it wasn't just specific downwinders it was really literally the entire world that was and remains the victims of the bomb so here we are proposition one I'm gonna go through this pretty fast Alan but uh, it, uh, this was a tremendous victory there was a lot of opposition to it and uh, the well actually there I mean, wasn't a there wasn't a lot of opposition to it because we put up vote yes on uh, initiative 37 posters all over town just before the special election and they didn't really know what was going on and so well i'm talking about some of the letters to the editor in the post there was you know yeah and, and then the a, but the afro-american came out with a wonderful editorial on on the its behalf it said in that in that article there, it said that uh, Delegate Norton would ignore and uh, what we went and had a meeting with I had a meeting with her and what she was objecting to was we were asking for a constitutional amendment. So we said, okay, you can introduce it as a bill and she has ever since. So this was just very briefly because I, I want to keep going. We, we, we weaved the web of peace and community and Louise, this was Louise's idea, and we brought out multicolored yarn and we literally weaved a web. Uh, and then on Nagasaki Day, we did a whole program on the human radiation exper uh, experiments uh, on poor people and people of color. We're not going to go into that, but uh, that's another part of the sordid, sordid history. Uh, maybe we need to do another program on that, maybe maybe later on this fall. And if so, Dennis, I'll, I'll talk with you because that's, uh, I think, something that's not understood about these those horrible experiments. Yeah, um, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, so this is an example of the kind of stuff that we did. There's Alan and Louise. That was right before I went to Japan for the first time. Right, this is uh, 95 at the Air and Space Museum. So I'm going to run through, I'll stop very briefly. Uh, Sally Hanlon, Rosemary Flynn, uh, the tall guy is Walter, I believe, Pat Burney, uh, Cynthia Johnson. So Rosemary was a longtime Grey Panther. Sally Hanlon was one of the really great uh, interpreters, Spanish to English interpreters. Uh, Walter, what, does anyone remember Walter's last name? So it's okay. So uh, this is out in front of the Air and Space Museum. This was the first exhibit when they exhibited the fuselage. Mr. Yasui. So this would have been in probably late May, early June of 95. Mr. Yasui's from Hokkaido. Uh, he then later invited the Latin a year later invited Louise and I to spend an entire week in Hokkaido as his guest. There's Tom Smith, and there is, that's Art Laffin, not sure who the woman is there. Uh, the woman with the flowers actually is the same woman who was part of the delegation to All Souls Church that rediscovered the Hankawa children's drawings. Uh, that's uh, Satoru Kanishi, professor of uh, German literature. He was the main organizer of the International Hibakusha Tours. It was his idea to send the Hibakusha out worldwide. And he and I were personal friends for, for the next 25 years. And that's Ann Tucker in the background. Oh, yes, there's Ann and Art. And Art Laffin, yeah, he was young there. This is again Suikyo Delegation with Louise uh, and all our friends from Japan, the World Conference. And there we are, they're talking about stopping the subcritical testing. So a lot of our friends are in the background. There they are, abolish nuclear weapons at the, at the White House. Very strong. There I am with uh, Thomas. Uh, and Yuki, isn't that Yuki? That's not Yuki, no. no? Uh, she, can't remember her name. She's with uh, Gen Suikyo. So there's Ellen and Louise. That's a beautiful picture, Ellen. You know, the two of you. Uh, this is Louise's map. I uh, put this in here because there's some stories afterwards. This is Louise and I. We took the map 
down to Cherokee, North Carolina for the International Indigenous Environmental Conference. This is us speaking at us Watts Bar when they were trying to start Watts Bar up again before they did. This is a picture of Louise. We got behind the barricades at Oak Ridge. And this is a really good picture of Louise standing in front of a waste pond. Uh, so and there, this is a so we made a cross country car tour, and uh, so we were in Kentucky. And Louise's one of her favorite singers was a, a songwriter by the name of John Prine, and he wrote a song called Paradise, which was about his hometown in Kentucky on the Green River and how beautiful it was, and how they built a coal mine, a strip mine, and they built the world's largest power plant at the time. And so Louise wanted to go there. So here's a picture of Louise in Paradise, Kentucky. So that's really uh, dramatic. I wish I had more time to talk. This is a picture. This is all the same time when we were doing a tour of the map. This is Louise at the Nevada test site. She's being led by a native Hawaiian uh, man and a young, young Shoshone woman. They took her up to the barrier. She was told uh, if you step across this line, ma'am, we're going to have to arrest you for trespassing. She looked at the guard and said, sir, I'm not the one that's trespassing. This is Shoshone Treaty Land, the Treaty of Rudy Valley, and you are the one that's trespassing. She proceeded to uh, step over the line, and there was an unplanned mass arrest of over 50 people. So, and then uh, we had to be in San Diego the next day because the San Diego Peace Center was paying for the trip. And I asked Louise as we were crossing Death Valley at three in the morning, I said, Louise, you didn't tell me you planned to get arrested. And her response was, this is the first time I was ever at the Nevada test site and you didn't really think I was gonna come here and not be arrested, did you? So, so another short story about Louise. Uh, John, it's yes. that gentleman on the left there, Irv Rishkin. No. Isn't that Irv Rishkin, the guy on the left there? No, it might be good Jim Good now, though. Definitely not Irv. This was in oh, the middle okay. of the this was in the middle of the Nevada desert. And there there okay. we are. We're doing a, a vigil or something. This may be as while Louise is being held, I think. And there's a picture of us. There's uh, Yuki Sato is in the middle. And uh, Yuki and I have been communicating, and she's been sending a lot of important documentation. Yuki was active with us from 19, uh, in the 1990s. She was a student at American University with Peter Kuznick. And she was another important person in our organizing. And Ellen, maybe you can say uh, 30 seconds about Yuki. Well, I stayed with her in 2019 when I went to um, I went to all over Japan. Um, yep. Yeah, and she she was wonderful. Wonderful. So, so in uh, 1996, she organized this a uh, huge demonstration. In fact, the largest under our auspices and peace action. We split uh, delegations into four groups. They visited 26 cities in 14 states. So the, all in all, this was probably the largest group of Hibakusha ever to visit the U.S. And it was our committee. It was actually myself and, uh, and uh, uh, Karina Wood from Peace Action. While we were out in the Nevada desert, we came up with this idea. And Yuki and one of her friends volunteered. They organized all of this out of the Great Panther office and they organized it in collaboration with Peace Action. So this is another example of the kind of work that we did and the enormous impact that we had. John? So, yes. Uh, that was the time that uh, Claudia Peterson was scheduled to go to Japan. You remember Claudia? Yes, of course I do, your cousin. She's not a cousin, but she's uh, from St. George. Right. Uh, she was scheduled to go there and travel around the various uh, areas from Hokkaido all the way to uh, uh, Nagasaki. And uh, she couldn't go at the last minute. So she ended up asking me if I would go in her place. And I actually went on her ticket. I, I flew using her ticket with her name on it. 
to Japan. Wow. And then I spent uh, uh, over a week, maybe maybe two weeks, I don't remember, but it was quite a long time going from one town prefecture to another, uh, giving talks about downwinders at each of these places. And Yuki Sato was my translator. She went with me uh, on this whole uh, circuit circuit of Japan. So then you, and you, you, and you and I made at least one trip later on together. Right, you and I made one later. So this, this picture here is May Day, early 90s, late 80s, and uh, Louise organized it, and it's Little Friends for Peace, and we're doing uh, uh, Dancing Around the Maypole. Uh, this was Louise's idea, and MJ is there, and Jerry, I think, is holding the ribbons at the top. Whoops. And there's Dennis and Sally Hanlon and Louise, just a really beautiful photograph there, a beautiful August evening, I'm sure. Early. Yeah, that's when I had hair. Mid, mid, mid 90s probably late 90s. it all fell out when i got lymphoma here's another beautiful picture of louise and the adoring young women one of my favorite pictures of louise absolute favorite ones another favorite picture of louise speaking at the world conference uh, that's uh betty kazimi next to her a uh, bob auerbach we sent six people on that delegation that would have been 96. so this is uh there was a 96 so louise is holding a thousand paper cranes that were folded by the children of washington dc so and that's her holding her humpty dumpty but doll and she placed those uh cranes on the statue and left them there for that the children of dc folded and the the person who's looking at her directly next to her is nelson and jane and then behind Nelson is one of the leaders, was one of the leaders of the movement in Rongelap, the survivors movement there. And behind him is Bob Auerbach. Hilda Mason and Charlie Mason. Hilda was one of our strong staunch. Uh, she was a city council person, a Green Party person, a DC State Party person. That's, that's her maybe at one of Louise's, maybe her 90th birthday party, I'm thinking. There's Louise at uh, one of the anti-space uh, wars. Is uh, Lucy Duff, is Lucy with us? Is Lucy yes, here? Yes, she's, she's still here. So Lucy, can you unmute for a second, talk a little bit about this photograph and some of your memories? Oh, Lucy, are you there? She's Got there, but she seems to be having a problem unmuting, or maybe she's not in the room. Yeah. Lucy, are you there? Can you unmute? Okay, we'll see if she comes back. But Lucy was a staunch member of our committee for many, many years, and now she's a staunch member in the the uh, there she is Green, Green, Green Belt Peace Committee. Lucy, why don't you to say a few words? Peace and Justice Coalition, we call it. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. Um, Remember this? But broadcast? many of the members are from Greenbelt. Um, uh, Bert Don was one of the founders and was always very um, eager to have us participate in the annual uh, remembrances of the bombing. Remember this pro this protest, Lucy? Um, oh, the great, yes, the um, Great inflated uh, missile. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. Was it? Uh, which one was it? Was Reagan or Bush? It may have been, or it may have been the first Bush. And they were going to militarize space. You know, Star Wars. Oh yeah, Star Wars. Mm -hmm. So that was part of that. So, oh, this picture is when Louise and I were in uh, Nago in the uh, late nineties. This was protesting against the uh, heliport that was going to destroy the the breeding grounds, the largest breeding grounds for the uh, uh, Asian dugong. And so that's us with the banner there in Okinawa. That's with Miss Inoue. She was president of the New Japan Women's Association. This is Louise and I in front of the Korean Cenotaph. This is before they moved it across the river uh, into Peace Park. 
So there was such discrimination against Koreans that it was not permitted for their cenotaph to be uh, put into Peace Park, even though as many as a quarter of the victims were Korean war slaves. That later changed. Uh, Hidankyo, the group we work with, spent years and years and years to get this monument moved into Peace Park where it belonged, and ultimately we won. So this is Sarah Magno, Paul Magno. Uh, that's Ariel, her little sister, and they're in their 30s now, and that's Louise, Give Back Our Children's Future. And Michael the, Wally. At the Pentagon. Michael Wally's behind Louise. Oh, yeah. Yep. So this was organized by the, and that's Jay Tomlinson, I think, right behind Michael. So mm -hmm. a lot yeah. of people there. Mm -hmm. Oh, so let's just stop and read this. Paul's uh, solidarity statement. Please know that those of us trying to do justice to the vision of Isaiah as supporters and actors join you and the Hiroshima and Nagasaki Committee in demanding a world free of nuclear weapons and all the lesser violences these weapons spawn at the expense of most of humanity. Let us continue to work and to pray for that vision. Paul couldn't be with us because they had an important uh, uh, a meeting, among which was Ellen Grady is going back to Ithaca to, to mar tonight. She's getting out of jail and going back to Ithaca tomorrow. So he couldn't be with us. This is Nelson Angine in uh, our living room back when I still had brown beard. Uh, John, John, uh, just a correction. It's Claire Grady. Oh, Claire. Uh, oh, Ellen, oh. Ellen Grady was that woman in the previous photograph. Right, right, right. No, oh, I know it was Ellen Claire. was in the back. Yeah, it's Claire Grady that uh, got out of jail. Yes, yes. I'm sorry. Thank you, Max. That's no problem. Uh, and this is Ellen uh, Nelson Angine in our living room. Um, this is the Gen Suikyo delegation. Uh, they would send a number of them. We we hosted a number of them uh, in D.C. Uh, this is uh, around the same time period. Kathy Shields, Art Laffin, Arjun. Not sure who the other person is. It's his it's daughter. Kathy. It's Kathy Boylan. Oh, Kathy. Yes, Kathy. What am I saying? Of course. And I think that's Arjun's daughter. Yeah, you're right. You're right. One of his two daughters. One of his two, right. So this is, I can't remember her name. Just but so we, you know, it's two after nine. Okay, so we're going to wind it up fairly quickly. This is down at the Sundance. We took one of the survivors there. And then the next day we drove to Harrisburg for the protest at Harrisburg. This is protesting outside Three Mile Island. It says Shinji and Concepcion. This is Louise receiving the Lewis Mumford Peace Award. And it was presented by Dan Ellsberg. So that was that, this is Louise of probably a few years earlier. Louise and Ellen and myself uh, at a supper in Japan. Uh, Jose Rodriguez playing the drums with Ellen. Jose <laughs> is still with us. I believe he's in Costa Rica right now, if I remember right. And Rudy Stouffer. And over to the right is um, uh, Kajimoto-san from Kobe. He yep. brought the he brought the uh, banner. Again, a different era back when things were different. This was the Stonewalk, young woman from the Stonewalk. This is Louise walk, washing the feet of the walkers. By hand, they pulled a 5,000 pound stone monument to the victims of war by hand from Massachusetts to DC. So this is Louise washing the feet of the marchers. This is Louise and I at the Cenotaph in Hiroshima. Louise and I singing We Shall Overcome. Louise and I at a protest, leading a protest in downtown Tokyo, I believe. Uh, this is Yuki and Miwa, and they're helping the children fold paper cranes. And Louise is enjoying the sun. Louise, beautiful picture of Louise and Arjun. Beautiful picture of Thomas. When would this have been taken? Early 2000s? 2000, 2000. Proposition one, convert the war machine. That was 2004. This was Alan in Kobe with our friends in Nuclear Free Kobe. That was definitely, there was a sister city relationship and we helped to welcome several of their delegations as well. This is Alan 
and Nobue Kubimaya from Kobe and Gensikyo. She was my um, interpreter my, um, when I first went in 1994 and we became friends. And still a good friend. Yeah, and that is Kajimoto-san. Uh, right, in Baden Kobe. This was Louise's last protest, September or January 2003. Uh, huge, the largest anti-war protest in world history around the world. This was taken in New York, bitter, 20 mile an hour winds, sub 20 temperatures. And you can see Frank Collins and Tony and Joan Drake and Louise, and I guess I took the picture. She's wearing her Palestinian solidarity scarf. So that was the last protest before she died. And there's a, that was Santana, Sayuri's uh, husband did that. And that's on the wall of my, of the living room here. So that's uh, Tanaka and Concepcion and uh, probably interpreter from Hidankyo. Uh, every year the Hibakusha would visit the anti-nuclear vigil and meet Thomas and then Concepcion and Alan. In October usually, that right? Yeah. yeah. Well, whenever they came, yeah. whenever they came, they would come. This is Concepcion and Thomas probably in the early 2000s, I would guess. There's Sayuri. This is part of the Peace Walk to New York. Would have been 2005. This is the Peace Walk. This is all the Peace Walk. So the walkers ended up there. While they were doing that, uh, um, Kiyokanda and I were organizing over 100 volunteers for the largest group. And there's Jay Marks in the background, who's no longer with us. Another tremendous organizer, tremendous energy. He really, really had a bigger than life personality. Uh, he died much, much too young. Uh, he continued to work with Ellen for several years. Uh, and went so to had, New Mexico for a while and worked with the activists there. <laughs> yeah. So there's Art Laffin and uh, some of the other marchers in New York, actually. That's so I was, Martha, I was, that's Martha Hennessy. She's, she's one of the uh, Kings Bay plowshares prisoners. Yep. Yeah, and so so this was 2005. So Kyokanda and I initiated uh, organizing over a hundred bilingual volunteers to welcome the Hibakusha to New York for the uh, uh, nuclear nonproliferation retreat uh, treaty review in 2005. It was the largest gathering of Hibakusha. Here they are on the stage. This is the largest gathering ever outside of Washington, D.C. So Peter Kosnick and I, I would say the two of us played a major role, the major role in organizing this particular event. Uh, so there I am speaking to the group. You can have the Abaksha there. There's Kevin Martin, Peace Action. Uh, um, there's um, Peter. Peter. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure who that is. I should know who that is. Robert J. Lifton was there. P Kurt, P Kurt Vonnegut was there. He walked out on him. Mm -hmm. uh, in the story, I'll tell I got a lot of stories I can tell people sometime. So here I, here I am, Tonica's there, uh, Nabui's there. Uh, there's Tonica speaking, I'm doing something. Yeah. Yeah, Yoey is now the general secretary. Back then, she was just a secretary. Now she is the, the head of, uh, of uh, Genswikyo. There we are, 60th anniversary plea. Can we continue to do it? Talking, talking about depleted uranium there. Talking about, yeah. Oh, hydrogen. They wanted to make a hydrogen cars and hydrogen filling stations and actually... Thinking back, it was Dennis, you and I talked about that and how that whole hydrogen economy thing was a stalking horse for nuclear power. You remember that? Yes. And there's Dennis and I, maybe we're talking about that actually. So that would have probably been after Louise died. I think that's Shinji taking a picture. There's Jay Marks. He has a Hibakusha pin on. And there's Thomas. This would have been what, 2005? Mm -hmm. Ellen? I guess somewhere, yeah, somewhere between before 2009. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm thinking, yeah, something like that. And there we go. There's Thomas's obituary. 
in 2009. Yeah, yeah some, some, some good ones. And this There's... is the last picture that I took of Concepcion on uh, August 5th, 2015. And she died January 25th, uh, 2016. There's and Lucy. Lucy, I wanted to get Lucy in there, one of our really great uh, cultural workers, cultural artists, Mr. Mr. Uh, say Mr. Miyake, maybe. But uh, there's Eleanor Holmes Norton, uh, Jay's that, in there. Yeah, Mel, that was Mel, that would, Mel that Hardy. Be... Mel, are you with us? Did Mel ever end up being with us? Yes. John? Mel, this is Glenn you... Carroll on the end. Who yep. is there? Glenn Carroll is on the end and uh, from Georgia. Yeah, Georgia, and uh, then next to her is uh, from Kansas City, and Sue Ellen Trump, I think. Right, and Rick is to behind uh, next next Eleanor Holmes Norton. Rick. Um, anyway, so New Mel, New Mel are you with us? Is Mel with us? That he was. So Mel, unmute for a second. If you're still there, there he is. He's still there. I think that's Mel. Yeah. Mel, are you there? Do you remember this photo? Maybe not. Keo uh, at uh, C-SPAN, actually. Carol Moore also spoke. Keo and I went in 2013, went to Fukushima. This is the town at Ground Zero. Mm -hmm. That's all that's left of it. Uh, this is the uh, uh, Namie elementary school uh, and you can see the debris in the background uh, Keo and I uh, this is Keo and I uh, in uh, 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 Namie a small town the town nearest uh, the reactor this is the radiation uh, reading 4.58 which is approximately 50 times or a little more than 50 times higher than background radiation in Tokyo. So this was, these were retired ha, principals uh, who built their dream home in, home in Namie. And it's, uh, they, was, they were heartbroken. Uh, inside it's rat droppings all over everything. So, and this was a really dramatic picture. Everybody had to abandon the town immediately. And this, these are the bikes that were parked there during rush hour. And they're still there, and you can see a lot of the the uh, tires are now flat. Everything was left the way it was. This is Filippos, who's still doing the banner or doing the uh, anti-nuclear vigil. Um, this is. Does anyone know any of these people? Is that Alan Barfield, maybe, on the right-hand side, possibly? Yes, it looks like it. So I'm going to continue on here. Here's Alan, Joe this Gerson, is... uh, Shinji at the World Conference, and Yuki is in the front, front and center, Yuki. So, and this is a picture of our committee. Uh, uh, this was probably uh, two years ago. And uh, Shizumi's in the middle, uh, Mel and I are there, Ellen, and Denise, and Dennis, and a whole bunch of others. And this was Mary Hanson Harrison, who's president who was president of Wilt at the time is there. Where is she? Which one is she? She's, she's the second from the left. Right. That, in fact, we may have had a meeting based because she was there, if, if I remember. But uh, so this is one of the la later photographs of the committee. So I wanted, this is the last one. And I just thought this is a photograph I took. It was really hard. I had to bend over and get the camera right down to the water on the opposite side of Peace Park. So those are the candle floats that I floated that the kids in D.C. made that I floated for them. And that's the atomic bomb dome in the background. So yeah. we're going to end it with that. So, so let's uh, just let anyone who wants any to make any final comments to comment. And then we're going to say good night. The link to the World Conference is in the chat if you want to join them now. Is there a code or can, will it just go straight through? I think it, you just go straight to okay. it, I believe. I think so. Thanks, okay. guys.
That was great, John. I really appreciated that. So, Bonnie, Bonnie, Bonnie Bick, you want to say a word, Bonnie? Uh, yeah, I'd love to. But, you know, you just disappeared. <laughs> so I can't get off mute. Here, we can hear you. Oh, you can. Oh, great. Oh, yeah. no, we I'm sorry. Covered. I can't see you right now, but that's uh, my camera's broke. Uh, uh, something's wrong. My camera didn't hook up. Introduce yourself, Bob. I just want to say that I was in heaven with you all tonight. I, I just miss your the beauty of this kind of action, uh, having been in isolation with the, the uh, COVID for so long. So, so, so I mean, it's just a beautiful, no, I did, I did just, I sort of went into isolation. I really haven't, I mean, I, I come out some, but you know, I, I haven't been attending events and I felt like I was with you and I, and it just opened my heart. And I just wanted to thank every one of you and say that this is an issue that is extremely close to my heart. Well, bon Bonnie was, um, you know, main organizer for Women's Strike for Peace and, uh, came to all of our commemoration activities and was a really great ally. And uh, she continues to do work, I think, down in Southern Prince PG County, right? I, right now, I'm fighting the expansion of a uh, aviation airport that, that is drop, dropping lead on two elementary schools that are just two uh, four tenths of a mile from the runway. And they want to double the size of the airport. All right, I'm going to be in touch with you offline because you know that uh, Billy Tyack is still alive. Oh, so yes, maybe, yes, maybe yes, we, yes. we can get him involved as well. Yes, so and, I'll, and, I'll be in touch. Yes, and Gabrielle is. So, okay. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, John. Thank so, you. So, uh, Dot, would you like to say something? Dot has uh, been with us the, for the last several years and has been an important contributor. John, we well, thank you for, for an excellent presentation. I'm, I'm quite awed by your, your memory. You remember everything <laughs> 40 years back. And I'm very impressed by everything you have done and all, all your friends here as well. Um, I can't find the link uh, in the chat box. So could you post it again to the, the conference, the World Conference? Go all the way back to the beginning. The very well, I, I, something really is wrong with my chat box. It shows nothing. Can you post it again, uh, Alan? Yeah, I, it, I just posted it a few minutes ago, and I'm posting it again. Right okay, now, now I see it. Thank you very much. All right, uh, so Mel, if you're there, can you unmute and say some final words? I've been asking him to unmute now for the past three or four minutes. Mel, can you unmute? Because if you don't, I'm going to say some final words. Mel, is that you? Not you. All right, let me say. Let me say a couple words, and that is that um, we, we're going to um, have a uh, in-person commemoration of Nagasaki, and that is going to be on August the 8th. We're going to gather in front of the church at Black Lives Matter Plaza at 945, and then depending on how many of us there are, we'll either stay there or else we'll move into the park. Uh, we'll have some uh, some electric candle lights, and I'll be posting uh, a reminder of that to everyone. So uh, if there's no one else who wants to speak, does anyone else want to say a word? If not, we'll say good, good night. I have one thing I would like to say, and that is that we need to um, tell our president that he needs to back away from uh, the modernization of nuclear weapons. He, he is not doing the right thing. And uh, someone reminded me of that today. And I, so it's my job to re remind others. Yeah, it's a nonpartisan thing. It's, uh, that's right. I, I really appreciate that. So I, if that's good, I'm going to call the meeting to an end and encourage everyone to connect with the world.